Blackwater Radio, the music you want. With your host, Steve Dan. Are you totally deranged? RadioWhat.com What's up, party people? It's Keys Dan with RadioWhat.com, DJLittleRock.com, coming at you live and in living color from the Radio What studios. And this is my podcast, What Makes You Famous? reason I started this podcast is I want to learn more about stuff. I feel that you have knowledge, and I feel that you can impart it on me and the rest of my listeners. Everyone has a story. What is your story? If you want to be a part of the program, give me a call at 501-470-6386. Or email me at what makes you famous at radiowhat.com. Today on the program, Ty King. Pretty much all I know about Ty King right now is that he's a marketing guru. Let's find out more about Ty King. Let's get into it. Calling Ty King. Hello, Ty King. Hey, how's it going? Is this the marketing guru? I guess you could call me that. (laughs) It's Keys Dan calling. You ready to do this? Absolutely. Let's get into it. All right. (laughs) Well, you're on. Tell me more about you. All I know right now is what I've read on the Facebook. Ty King Services. Your marketing Uh service out of Moralton, Arkansas. Tell me more. All right. Well... I guess you want to go back to how this all got started, uh, the origin story. I guess. Oh, we'll, we'll go back to where you got started. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I guess it's a true origin, is it? Sure. Go ahead. All right. Well, um, let's see. I was born in Dardanelle, Arkansas, mm-hmm. and uh, my parents were from Dallas. They moved down here and started living on one of the properties of one of their relatives, uh, after I was born, built a house, and there's a long string of just uh, years of uh, living in places like Appleton, Arkansas, and Jerusalem, places you probably never heard of, and probably wouldn't ever if you hadn't been listening to this. And um, uh, my father was an abusive alcoholic. It was one of those situations. Uh, he and my mom used to fight a whole lot, uh, violent, outright screaming, and all this, and so for me, my little brother, it was, you know, going up to our room or hiding right behind a corner until just, you know, the madness and chaos stopped. And a few times, you know, my mom would separate and take us and we would go live with, you know, our grandmother or uh, stay at a, you know, a shelter or something like that. Wow. But it always, yeah. Yeah. So those kinds of situations. And wh- how old were you back. at this point? Ooh, that was, I mean, you know, from the time that I was born. Up until, well, I guess when I moved out after I graduated high school. Wow. So, so your whole yeah. young life has been just tumultuous. Yeah. Yeah. It was like that. So, uh, so how, how often did you get uh, put out of the house where you had to go to sir, uh, to shelters and, and uh, other relatives? I mean, it, was, it was at least, you know, maybe twice a year every time <laughs> when it got that bad. Oh, my. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So okay. I was pretty, uh, I was, I was an introvert, you know what I mean? I ha- always have been. And so even when my brother was born, you know what I mean? I still didn't talk or play a whole lot with other people. And so my whole thing was, you know, I wanted to dress up like a superhero or a Ninja Turtle or something. And I wanted to stay in that. I was in costume 24 <laughs> seven. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it sounds like a, a, a rough beginning, but you said, yeah. Yeah, okay. And when you were a kid, you liked to dress up like superheroes okay oh yeah definitely and so that's what i model myself after you know becoming becoming that character uh and so i would stay and i would be in my own little fantasy world while all this other chaos is going around me and um sticking towards that um when we moved to jerusalem yeah when i started going to uh public school again how old are you then uh, at wonderview i started there in fourth grade okay Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, all the way up through high school, you know what I mean? I was pretty much the same kind of kid, kind of a kind of a loner, you know, even though I had friends, you know what I mean? I had a very exclusive circle of people that I talked to, confided in, and went and did things with. And at this point, you're, but, uh, you're running around in superhero 
garb? Uh, no, not in public anymore. No, okay. Really, All right. really, really was switched from that to like being alone in my room and turning the music up to 11 and standing up. It was like a, I had this, <laughs> this spool that cables are usually wound around, but it was just an empty spool and I would have it in the center of my room and I would stand on it with this microphone that wasn't plugged into anything and I would perform every song on these CDs. And that was my, uh, that was my escape there. <laughs> I think a lot of people saying in their rooms. I, I uh, might be showing myself on that one. Oh, yeah? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so you relate a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I can relate to that. But, uh, you know, that informs you. It, it it lets us know where you started. Now, yeah. you say you, you did this all through high school. Mm-hmm. Now, what about after high school? After high school? Well, I moved. Well, let's see. Before I graduated, I went. I was uh, approved. Yeah, I did very well throughout school. You know, oh. grades, grade wise, and you know, I mean, didn't smoke a cigarette until I was actually eighteen years old. And uh, well, then maybe you rebelled against your parents because my mother drank and yeah. she smoked, and and I never yeah. did. So yeah. maybe I rebelled against her. <laughs> I mean, that's a good way. Of, and really stayed clean. Like that <laughs> yeah, it's a good way to look at it. Sure enough, you know, my mom always, my mom always tries it real hard. You know, I mean, to give us the best life, but she was just trapped in that abusive type of relationship where you, I don't know, you sort of become dependent on that person, even though they are a parasite on you. And um, so, anyways, but you try uh, to help in any way you can. I'm sure. Oh yeah, I mean, try to. But I mean, there's only so much you can do when somebody you love is in one of those types of relationships and they just can't break free of it. But yeah, I went to uh, governor school because of my grades and because of my talent in music. What's uh, governor in, school? Arkansas governor school is, uh, it's a program during the summer. It's usually during your sophomore in between that and your uh, senior year. Mm-hmm. And it's just sort of like uh, to prep you for uh, college but they only accept 400 students out of the state and it's for like specific talents in, in certain areas. Like mine was for music, but they also had like literary arts and, you know, uh, math or science. And so if you excelled in one of those areas, you had to go through a screening process and, uh, 400 students out of the state get to go to this. So where's that located in Little Rock? At Hendrix and Conway. Hendrix and Conway. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would have imagined it would have been in Little Rock because of the governor, but certainly H- Hendricks and Conway. So I think it's, it's called the governor school because uh, Bill Clinton, when he was the governor of Arkansas, I think he was the one that implemented that program. So they just called it governor school. <laughs> well, there you go. So, yeah. So. And, and you did but, this in 11th and 12th grade then? Yeah, in between 11th and 12th for that summer. And I mean, that's when really it changed my life because I started actually socializing with people and uh because at that point you know i had been i was sort of the rebellious type of clothing i guess you'd say uh wearing black all the time and you know listening to just you know stuff you probably wouldn't want to play in your grandma's house you know what year was this and, uh, uh that that year in between 11 and 12 no but what year was this I, i'm not even sure how old you are oh lord uh, how old are you <laughs> i'm 33 years old now so this was 2003 okay yeah yeah. So what kind of music and, were you listening to at the time? Oh, Lord. Uh, a lot of like, <laughs> the crazy rap stuff or like the, the heavier metal type bands, you know, the stuff of the, the early 2000s, you know, corn and things like that. Well, at that point, heavy metal and crazy rap were kind of mashed together. They were, yeah, they were mashed. You know, so it went with the lifestyle. But yeah, uh, so I was used to. You know, being in somewhere called Jerusalem, Arkansas, which is out in the sticks where nobody knows where it's at, uh, you know, you start dressing like something like that there. And I mean, they, they're <laughs> quick to, you know, of course, make fun of you or, you know, kick you out to the side and not have anything to do with you. You're weird, you're a freak. Uh, and so you just become a social outcast, which, you know, shoved me further down in my, you know, uh, asocial uh, area where I was anyway. So I was tired in my shell. And uh, honestly, the, the anxiety of actually being around people almost kept me from going to governor school when I was accepted. But yeah, I, I was so glad when I went there because I got to stay in the dorms for the whole summer. And uh, like the other 399 kids that were there, like every one of them was like openly embracing me and just everybody else. And so it was completely just, I mean, like, so weird. It was like a utopia almost that I walked into, you know. Yeah, that felt like a whole new world to you coming out of uh, 
uh, well, the life that you'd known where yeah. you were kind of outcast or. Yeah. And there was people that were you know introducing me to music that I really kind of like, like uh, modest mouse and uh, people like that. And so we were I was meeting people and learning how to uh, use social skills and uh, how to just hang out and just be people without having to worry about what is that person thinking about me right now, you know? So you say music, what, what did you play? Uh, I was there for tenor saxophone. Tenor sax. You still play? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I haven't played in so long. No, I don't lose tenor it. Tenor sax yeah. is a beautiful instrument. Yeah. I don't know what it is. And it's pretty to look at, but <laughs> so yeah, you- I'll pick it up somewhere. I still have mine. So I'll, I'll pick it up one day. I need to get a new mouthpiece for that. <laughs> well, getting, uh, getting over, uh, into the governor's school you were you had to be pretty good yeah uh i think uh, you know chances and just uh just luck uh happened <laughs> so while you were at the governor's school what kind of activities did you do playing with a, a band or with other members yeah, so yeah it was a full orchestra and so we were there um i was playing you know of course we had a huge string i went from playing in a uh you know like a pet band type situation at my school to play in this huge and you've got like maybe 20 players of you know playing violins or violas and uh there's cellos and we got timpanis in the back and so <laughs> very different situation so i'll let yeah i loved it so how big was the band at the governor school in that summer of 2003 oh, wow uh, i would say it was probably about 50 people maybe out of the 400 so a yeah, lot of them yeah. were there for music yeah there was, there was a big music section so did you get along with only all the music members or did you you say you got along with every, all the 400 kids absolutely yeah i got, I got along with it's just everybody uh which was surprising because they're all from you know different backgrounds and just different you know economical situations to uh yeah, the way people dress or their type of personality. I mean, like everybody got around, whether they were, you know, there was, I remember, um, there was a girl from India who kept to her, you know, her family's customs. And like, it was so out of place to me because I've never seen that before. But so? still, everybody was just so, you know, it was like, it wasn't a big thing at all. It was, this is just who that person is. And so it really opened my eyes. I was like, wow, there are really people out there who do this. How, how and, so? Uh, what customs what was she observing that you found interesting? Like not plucking the eyebrows. That okay. was one thing that I noticed. And just, uh, I don't know, the way she carried herself. And, uh, you know, she, she spoke a little bit of her you know, the native language, you know, around other people. And, like, wasn't bashful or shy about it or anything. She just <laughs> went with it. Well, it sounds and, to uh, me that that summer of 2003 was a turning point in your life. It and definitely, it- definitely was. And, um, the, the, you know, the sad part is that it had to end and that I had to go back to where I was. And so I did. And you're so limited on <laughs> people at that school of who you can hang out with, who you can have friends with. But of course, you know, we're social creatures. And so we have to have, you know, people around us. Um, and so I started hanging out with, uh, people that had some really bad ideas of what we should be doing. And so it was just like uh, car surfing and so, you know, really stupid ideas, stuff you see on Jackass. You know what I mean? That's what we were into. Hey, I saw Team uh, Wolf. I, I, I remember car surfing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so this is uh, 2003, 2004, 12th grade yeah. back in Jerusalem. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Back were you able to get in the band? Yeah. I, I mean, I was in the, uh, the school band. Uh, the entire time throughout high school okay so you did have a group of kids that you were able to socialize with a little bit yeah 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 do you keep in touch with any of of the uh, the folks from governor school you you know no i really don't jerusalem i mean you you see people on uh facebook you know what i mean and you don't you really have a quick conversation like oh hey yeah it's been so long well that was a blast from the past. That's over. Let's go back to real life now. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I know that face. Yeah. Uh, there's five yeah. minutes. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. All right. So, okay. So after high school, I mean, after high school to college, maybe? No. I was enrolled to go to UCA. Uh-huh. But by then, my people anxiety had just like risen so high that I just, I didn't even go. Understood. I don't, I don't know why, because I, I went back to that same, you know, area that i was at at that school 
And like, it was back to that limited mindset, you know what I mean? Where everything's put in a box and, you know, be honest, there was a lot of bigoted people there. And if you weren't like them, then you just weren't anything at all. Oh, for sure. So, yeah. okay. You're in Jerusalem. You're out of high school. What do you do? Mm-hmm. So I moved to Conway, uh, because oh. I was going to go to UCA and I moved in, uh, with some people that I had been hanging out with in high school. And, uh, so we all just moved to Conway. Uh, got an apartment. Uh, it was 2004? And, mm-hmm, in 2004. And then, of course, started drinking because they were drinking. Started smoking weed because they were smoking weed. Uh, you know, gave in to pressure of influence. I had uh, you know, somebody walked up with, with uh, meth and a light bulb and walked up to me and was like, hey, man, you want some? And I was like, nope, I've seen what it does to people. I'm not doing that. So thank God I've never done anything hard. Uh, I just smoked and drank, which I mean, that's, I, I hate that, but still, um, I'm glad that I never touched that other stuff. No, understood. Uh, my mother, she, uh, on my 18th birthday, or I guess I was just 18, uh, mm-hmm. she was, uh, smoking weed in her room and she, uh-huh. she offered me my first hit and I said, uh, no, thanks. Kind of walked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so rebellious against my mother. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There you go. More rebellious. Yeah. So, um, so you got this group of friends, eh, not going so well, or not a good group. Yeah, it's of kids. not going well because they don't come up with great ideas. And so, I'm working at Movie Gallery of all places, which is an out of date thing now. What is it? Um, movie Gallery. It was kind of like Blockbuster, but it was like a smaller level. Where was that? In Conway. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Yeah. And, video store uh, then. So you got to watch a lot of movies. Oh yeah, of course. That's I was a big. I've always been a big movie buff. But, so, I mean, so anyways, uh, when I so moved into, I mean, it's a, hey, actually the whole time period right there, moving in Conway, those first few years, like it's all a blur of like what happened because I'm starting to move around from like one apartment to another, to another, to another, to another, to another, and I uh, just couldn't hold down a place to live, couldn't hold down a job, just that kept becoming just completely unsatisfied with everything in my life after about a two, you know, two month period. And I go to this and two months and I go to this for two months. Oh, so you didn't stay the whole time at that movie gallery then? No, 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 of course not. What other Joe jobs did you have? Oh, Lord, what did I do? I worked at, let's see, there was a Dollar General, there was a furniture store. Uh, I was digging pools and spas, and uh, I think I held that one down the longest. I really, I kind of enjoyed it. Yeah, working Um, outside, sure. Yeah, yeah, it was was fun. Working with your hands. walls, and yeah. And uh, so anyways, and I've always been, you know, pretty talented in computers and everything, but I didn't see myself actually getting a job in you know, IT or anything like that. But so I limited myself in that area and uh, was pursuing music. I uh, actually got with some other guys that were uh, into the same kind of music that I was, that I was into at that time. And Still Modest Mouse? <laughs> yeah, a little bit of Modest Mouse, a little, <laughs> bit of, uh, a, little, a little bit of everything else. Okay. So, All right. And yeah. Any any of that heavy metal or crazy rap uh, sneak in there? Oh yeah, of course it was. You know, some of them were you know uh, were heavily into like the horror rap type stuff. You know, horror rap. So, Explain that horror rap. Like you've heard of uh, ICP or sure. Anything like, yeah, so that type of stuff there, where they would paint their faces and um, go on stage and you know act crazy and stuff. So I joined in on all that. So did I you dress like, up like the insane clown posse? They did, but they tried to have their, like their own spin on it, and really doesn't make much sense to what they did. And so it's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> so I went with it, and I was like, I'm in a punk rock lifestyle, you know what I mean? So I was like, I went with it, and uh, I was very out of place there. You know what I mean? <laughs> like everybody knew it. And like, I'm guessing okay. this is around 2007, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it was right, yeah, right around 2007. Um, and. Oh, see, I ended up getting married to this <laughs> this girl there who sat down, poked me in the neck, and told me she was going to marry me the first night she was there. And so it was like, okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it just kind of went like that. And, <laughs> uh, of course, you know, was, relationships were just as much of a mess as my living situation was. and. Uh, holding down jobs and so it was just it was just chaos and like anytime i didn't want to be around anybody more i would just act really volatile so that they wouldn't want to be around me well this is your early 20s uh, still smoking still drinking oh yeah yeah okay yeah it was it was a party lifestyle trying to chase down you know music dreams and all that 
Um, but I was such a mess and such a, <laughs> anybody that came across my path, like I was, you know, came to a point to where I wasn't contributing anything to their lives. I was just making a negative impact on everybody. And, All right. Uh, time for another turning point. All right. 2003 yeah. was big. Uh, when, yeah. when did you touch a computer and make All that right. a part of your life? Oh, that was, uh, I think we had our first gateway computer back in so what, 98, I think it was. Okay. So they've, they've always been a part of your life then. Oh yeah, definitely so. And so I've always been fascinated with the the, uh, the inner workings of it, you know, how the boards work and uh, from the hardware to the software and what, what is everything that I can change? That was, you know, big, I spent hours and hours and hours and hours as a kid, just going through and trying to find a different way to change settings or to mess with the code so that I could just change one little detail, like a color spot on the, the start menu or something and just be so proud of myself after I did it. <laughs> so in 1998, you were using a computer primarily for what? Um, you know, nothing really productive, I guess you'd say. Uh, it, was, it was amazing that I had all this information at my fingertips. Of course, we had like a, the digital version of, you know, in, in card encyclopedia. <laughs> Sure, a- AOL yeah. was was big then, and yeah, AOL was chat big. rooms. <laughs> yep, and so yeah, I was doing a lot of those uh, Geo Cities and uh, what was it, Yahoo Communities, I think it was called, and uh, then came along uh, what was the one uh, MySpace. Ah. and so that really that really got me in when I was like, okay, when well, I could get into design, and so that really hit a note with me. Uh, I've still got eleven thousand friends on MySpace. I'm not giving it up. <laughs> is this still a thing? I've never even tried. Wow. I'm in there somewhere. <laughs> Last time I opened like the page, 50. still got 11,000 friends. Okay. Wow. Okay. Great. <laughs> well, they're still there. Well, it came from yeah. when I was working on the radio in Miami. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And uh, anyway, so all this culminated to I have, you know, I got, got married. It was on, it was stupid enough. So it was on 420. We didn't say any vowels. It was just. Uh, What's okay, 420? You know, now you're married. Oh, uh, April, oh, April, the, April, 20th, April 20th, which is also a weed reference. You know what I mean? That 420 was the, was the weed smoking time, so we thought it'd be funny to get married on 420. All right, then. So you shared yeah. the lifestyle. It seemed like you, right. had a, you had a girl that was into your interest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, our relationship was, you know, completely, you know, just, it was terrible. Uh, it, not too physical or anything. It was just like, you know, mentally tearing each other down or, you know what I mean? If we, you know, always you know hunting down you know weed or something to drink because that was the only way you could tolerate being around each other and it's just like looking back it's like wow wow why did i even put myself through any of that why did i put anybody else through it that doesn't make any sense but um yeah in 2007 uh one of those times i went to one of these uh the parties uh was actually at a guy's house who i went to high school with and um there was a guy there who was cutting on his arms and trying to throw blood on people and uh, uh, helping himself to the guy's refrigerator and, I don't know, just, just helping himself to the house like he, like he lived there. Um, and he was you know, very psychologically unbalanced. And uh, the guy that owned the house, he was like, I want this guy. I said, like, well, go say something to him. I'm just going to say it. And he's like, no, I don't want to say anything. And then uh, so I told the guy, I was like, hey, listen, you got to go. You can't stay here. They don't want you here. Just leave. And so after that, he left and had seen some people from that party. I guess he would run into them at Walmart and places. Sure. And uh, he would tell them that what he's going to do to me and you know my family and uh, the guy that owned the house and his family. He was going to you know kill his dogs and Ooh. do all do all kinds of crazy things, burn his house down, and all kinds of stuff. Um, so needless to say, a very unsportsmanlike fellow. W- what else happened? Yeah, yeah, I wasn't wasn't a wasn't a team player. So, anyways, uh, long story short, no, make it longer. <laughs> make it real long. Um, so many, uh, Lord, such such a long story. But um, the guy that owned the house, he's he started seeing where uh, he was. He would have people, you know, looking at him while Walmart, looking for him. And it was reported back. You know what I mean? He was. Uh, at Walmart one time, and so he was like, "Hey, we need to come up here. We need to go scare him, give him a lesson, and uh, teach him not to come around or mess with us anymore." And you I was say, like, did okay. he work at Walmart? No, he was just. I don't really know where he was living or what he was doing. He was sort of just a drifter, I guess. I got you. And um, so I was like, okay, you know, 
went there and uh, he uh, called him out at out Walmart. I mean, which is the parking lot and went uh, back behind this like tire store and was like, you need to get out of here. You're not saying anything again. Da, 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 da. And went through the whole motions of just trying to uh, scare him into getting out of the town and then uh, chased him off. And I was like, okay, well, that's done. Well, I don't know what was it a few days later. He called me back and he's like, you know what? He still hadn't left and he's still making threats. And uh, he was really getting worried about his house, his family and everything that was going on. So he's like, we just need to go and, and, and really scare him and really you know, put some fear into him so he doesn't want to be here. And so anyways, uh, see him, it was me. And it was my wife at the time, and there was another girl that we just knew. And between all of us, it was a brilliant plan that we were going to go out there and we were going to fight him. Uh, we were going to take him in the car, go fight him, and uh, put some fear into his life and uh, make it to where he'd stop messing with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was like, we've watched way too many movies at yeah. this point, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this stuff just doesn't happen in real life, but apparently we thought it did. So, so what ended up uh, happening? Well, uh, he got in the car. Um, actually, he, he, he voluntarily got into the, tr the trunk, wanted to ride in the trunk. And the guy that owned the house, the he was trunk. like, yeah, okay, well, that's fine. And so drove him out to the field. And uh, the guy I was with ended up taking a baseball bat and beating this guy to death. Oh, my. In the field. Yeah. So now I'm an accomplice to murder. Yeah. And the next day, uh, see my uh, wife at the time, her mother was Conway PD and her dad was state reserve. And, uh, the, you know, she went and was like, told them what happened. And then all of a sudden I've got a warrant out for my arrest for, you know, for murder. Oh no. Yeah. So they picked me up went to the station and, you know, and I helped him in every way I possibly could. Sure. I uh, took him out to where he had thrown the baseball bat. I, uh, you know, told him what had happened. And he's like, well, he said, I got bad news for you. And I was like, why? He's like, we have to arrest you because you have charges of murder on you. Oh, so, okay. And, you know, of course that, this is like, it just doesn't feel real. It feel, it's like mind numbing. Like I'm gonna wake up at any moment, but it just didn't happen. And so instead, I woke up in a jail cell. And uh, oh, and this is 2007. There. This is 2007. The end of it. Yeah. Big year I, for you. Uh, yeah, I was, I was saying, that's got married. Uh, you know, did all this crazy stuff. Yeah. And and, and uh, thrown in jail at the end. Yeah, thrown in jail at the end. Yeah. Then what happened? So, that's what I, I spent my time there. Um, the first few days I was there completely alone and just really just going through my head of like, what, what, what is this? You know what I mean? Trying to grasp what was going on in my world and then doing pretty much what I just did with you starting from the beginning and then going through there and be like, where, what, what happened? What went wrong? You know what I mean? Um, so nobody visiting and, you here, mom, dad, anybody? And see, but not, but not when you're in isolation, you can't have that. And so when you're first taken in, uh, until you're put into like the main population, you can't have any visits or anything. Oh my! And how how so, many days is this? It was. I think I was there for like five days by myself. Oh. Um, yeah. So I was going through that, and I was like, okay, something has to change. I've got to change myself. I have to, you know, sort of like what we've done here and seeing those life changing events and what happens in what year. It was like I've got to make one happen now because if I continue doing this. You know, I mean, I may never, ever get out of prison or yep. I may end up dead or, you know, somebody else might lose their life because of something stupid that I did. So this is and five so, days without a lawyer? Mm -hmm, yeah. Nobody. Nobody. Yeah. That doesn't sound like America. You figure you get a phone call, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you think you, you hear stories. No, I actually cut the phone line to my cell, so I, I couldn't make phone calls. Um Mm. Yeah, I okay. mean, you see things on TV, and you, know, you think that's how court or America goes, and everything. But it's not, you know. I mean, once no, no, this there, is a television show right here. <laughs> yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah. I've never heard of that where somebody gets thrown in the jail in yeah. the middle of America, 
and five days with no no contact. All yep. right. Well, maybe we'll circle back to that, but okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, so anyway, uh, they took me to the main population, and I was there for two years waiting on trial uh, two in the meantime. years mm-hmm. in two jail. Years. In jail, no formal and, charges. I mean, uh, for, I mean, no, no trial. No, no, no trial. Yeah, they they say you know there's uh, it's supposed to be a speedy trial, which means they have, they have to give you a trial within a year or nine months. I can't remember which one it is now, but uh, the statutes on that don't don't actually run out because what they don't they don't tell you is that they can put a hold on it if like uh, say they wanted the way they did it with me was they put a psychological exam on me. And it said that I, they could hold that time off until I can have a trial, until I have a uh, psychological evaluation. And they didn't take me to my psychological evaluation until about a year and a half later. So that doesn't sound right, <laughs> right? So, but so you're stuck. All right, you're, you're you're in general population in prison. Where where about where was this? That was in Faulkner County in Conway, Faulkner County, and this is till two thousand nine. Then. Yeah, yeah, 2009. And so I went to trial. Uh, the jury found me not guilty of first degree murder, uh, but they found me guilty of second degree murder because I didn't report it. And so that's just as much, that's kind of like being an accomplice. It's the same thing. Um, so they dropped it down to second degree and uh, they gave me 30 years in prison. Uh, well, they have different classification systems. So, like, you have, you know, A, a B, charge, a C, a D, E. And uh, so this was on the A. And the way they described it in in the uh, the trial was that if they sentenced me in 30 years on the A, which is the max on second-degree murder, then I would actually only have to do a quarter of that, and then I'd be eligible for parole. And so that was seven and a half years. Uh but apparently your time in jail doesn't really count towards that. What? And so those two years that I just did <laughs> yeah, doesn't really count towards anything. That um, doesn't sound right at all either. <laughs> right. Well, sometimes they'll tell you that oh, they took the time off, but it's off the back end, which doesn't make any sense either. So anyways, uh, that's neither here nor there. Yeah. When, uh, well, obviously you didn't spend 30 years in jail. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> obviously i didn't thank okay. god uh so you're sentenced first, in 2009 30 years in uh, jail what happened i spent the first two years at uh, a place in grady arkansas called cummins it was a very 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 big prison um and because of my skills with you know the building swimming pools i actually i got a job at the uh where all the officers and like the, the higher ups, that's where they live, like the wardens and the lieutenants, they all have houses in this one area off of the the compound. And they have a community swimming pool. And so I actually got a job maintaining it and making sure the chemical levels are right and cleaning it. So all right. I actually got a de- decent decent job compared to what a lot of guys got. <laughs> Seems like it, but you still gotta go yeah. home every night to this little box. And that's exactly it, yeah. So you go to this little reverie. And then in the, at nighttime, you come back and you're just in hell. You know what I mean? People screaming and, you know, of course, there's, you know, the, the fights and wondering if the guy next to you is going to stab you, even though know, they're, you know, they're nice. And if anybody offers you anything, you really got to think this through. Okay, is this guy somebody I can actually trust? Um, because they may come back for something else. Absolutely. Hardly anything for free. And, I mean, just like, I've, I've never seen more drugs in my life than what I've seen in prison. Um, so there was, you know, lots of those going on. Of course, the drug addicts, they go into prison and then network and they find, you know, just, I guess just piles of drugs somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, so they're running around high and, uh, of course they're making, you know, uh, alcohol and, and you know, what they call it hooch, you know what I mean? So there's, you know, plenty of drinking and drugs. You know, so drinking drugs were you still using stuff. it at the time? No, no, I, I stopped immediately. Uh, well, as soon as I got to jail, actually, I haven't uh, touched marijuana or alcohol since then. Hey, well, st- jail, jail solved something. Yay! Yeah, yeah, it really, it really did save my life. And I know that sounds weird, but I mean, it, it did um, because I made that turning point. Okay. And so after those two years, and you know, I got tired of coming into this you know, the living hell at night, 
heard about a program uh, that was in Wrightsville, just outside of Little Rock. So this is 2011 then? Yes, 2011. I came there in December. So uh, it was called Pathway to Freedom. And it was a you know a biblical based program that was supposed to help you with life skills and just you know basically getting your life together and being a better human being. Um, so I was like, all right, well, it sounds like brainwash to me, but I'll go over there just to see how it is. <laughs> and so I went. And, sounds like a good uh, way to approach it. Well, I mean, being skeptical about it, I guess it's the same way as you go about anything. You know, sure. It really changes your life. It's good to be skeptical uh, so that you don't have those expectations of it's going to be, you know, masterful and life-changing. You know what I mean? You actually get in and you get surprised and actually the things you're supposed to be learning actually have time to take root and to change the things that they need to. So, Okay. Uh, so you get into you, this program, uh, mm-hmm. Pathway to Freedom. Yes, and immediately they put me in the computer lab because of my skills. And so I was teaching guys uh, uh, at least one class a day. I would teach people how to use Microsoft Word and Excel and uh, Access, and I would teach them how to use PowerPoint and how to how to code. And, uh, and the ones that really wanted to learn, you know, how to make you know things like simple video games and things like that. Well, that sounds productive. <laughs> it good was. Good use it of was. your time in jail? Sure. It was. And I got on the praise team there. Okay. And, um, I mean, it was a completely different environment. It's a culture shock going from main, the main prison going into this program where there's only 200 people. Um, and so it's all guys that are trying to change their lives, and they want to be better people. And so you are you hold each other accountable. You're going through these classes all day long, and you're applying what you learned. Okay. And so that's what it's about. So you say this is faith based. Did it solidify your faith at all? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I definitely have a much stronger relationship with God because of that. You know what I mean? It was sort of wishy washy before. Okay. Even though I would read the Bible and, but I would like, I don't know. It's kind of like the nose in your ear type Christian. You know what I mean? You look around all these ruffians around you and you're like, I don't act like that. And so <laughs> it's right. Hide yourself, hold yourself higher than, uh, than other people. It was kind of like that. Even though I was like, man, I'm in the same spot they're in. I wear the same kind of clothes they're in. All right. And, um, so you're in this program, 2011. Mm-hmm. Until yeah. so it changed my perspective of just how to see people as people and seeing that everybody needs help and everybody is, you know, has those things that's not going to make them perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect person. It doesn't make sense that people try to project that or try to expect that out of anybody else. And uh, I joined the praise team. Sure. Uh, and I learned how to play guitar in about a month. Hey, and cool. yeah, I started singing. And then I learned how to play guitar and sing at the same time. <laughs> Very and good. Just moved around. Out. And I stayed there for, whew, what was it, seven, seven and a half years I was there at the program. Um, and this is all in, in, in prison? It's an in prison. And, but it's supposed to be like a pre-release program and so you're only supposed to spend like 18 months doing the classes and then after that point you know usually the protocol is you go up for parole and you know they grant you parole because you went through this program and they see the changes that you made but that's not necessarily always the case and so, so when was the next time you went to par- uh, went for parole hearing uh, 2011 you started this program and yeah, you got into I it i think it was i believe it was 2000 and let's see 15 i'm going to say that i went out for my first time yeah 2015 and uh they denied me even though i had a perfect record never had a disciplinary which is unheard of oh uh had done everything that they could possibly ask me to do uh yeah. plus um you know what i mean still going out of my way to help guys and try to teach them you know uh, computer skills or design skills or uh, learn how to play an instrument sure or just you know listen to their problems you know um well, it sounds like but you were doing the work, you know, you were you're trying I to get yourself that. clean and, and straightened up. Definitely. Definitely. Cause I had to be, somebody. <laughs> Oh, I got divorced by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. She yeah, left yeah. you I all divorced, came in shortly after I went to prison. Uh, she became a stripper addicted to drugs and all kinds of other things. And it was just, yeah, it was downhill and it was, you know, thank God that was severed. Yeah, um, yeah. probably, probably better off that you left that behind. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, so anyways, they denied me my first time up. 2015, because, denied parole. Mm-hmm. Yep, okay. denied parole because they said it's protocol for the first time that a violent offense goes up. They give, they uh, 
deny you. And I was like, you know, it sort of devastated me, but I was like, okay, well, that means I'll, I'll get out next time. Okay. So 2016 comes up. Okay. We stay with the program. Still, still in that I'm faith still base. There. Still praise, still praise team, guitar, praise team. singer. Yep. I was, I was leading at that point and, you know, doing very well and found a lot of talent and, you know, I guess really my, one of my callings. And, um, I get a letter in March of 2016, uh, right before I'm about to go out for parole. Mm-hmm. And it's from one of my friends that I haven't heard from in years. 2016, and like, you get a letter. Like, yeah, like since before I've even, uh, before I got locked up and everything. So it was from, I guess I met her back in 2004 okay. when I first moved to Conway. And so I haven't really heard from her since then. And um, so she's telling me all about her life and her brother, which I knew. And uh, how he had passed away, and oh. you know, it was sort of wrecking her. And uh, she just wanted to reach out because she it really inspired her to see how you know people make an impact on other people's lives. Sure. And so I guess she was just trying to see, you know, like what kind of effect did I have on you? And uh, we started talking and writing each other, and like it was yeah, you know, almost instantly, uh, how we meshed and we clicked together. And I was like, okay, this this is the girl. This is her. This hey. is the one for me. And so, uh, definitely had her <laughs> head on straight. Thank God. And she's been, uh, she already had one degree in, uh, criminal justice and she was getting another degree, uh, in political science mm-hmm. at UCA and, um, had a daughter, uh, was just telling me all the details of her life. And so we really got to know each other through those letters. You know, I think even better than we would have in person because like we you just meet somebody face to face. It's like, you don't really get to see everything that's going on inside their head. And so I think writing out our thoughts and, and you know, beliefs and how we see ourselves in the future. You know I mean? It was, uh, it was kind of critical that we get to know each other through letters like that. But anyway, so she, ends up going with me to parole. Uh, her name is Tara. Okay. And uh, so we're like, okay, well, after this, you know, we're going to go out and uh, do those things that we talked about. You know what I mean? <laughs> we're going to have a, a picnic at the park. We're going to do uh, you know, dinner at this restaurant. We're going to, you know, uh, meet each other's families and all this. Um, and they denied me again. Oh my. 2016 yeah. denied. Mm-hmm. 2016 denied. And so, I mean, it really tore her up to where she just fell on the floor and, like, couldn't pick herself up all day long after she heard the results of that. Yeah. um, Because they don't tell you right there. It's usually two weeks later after you have your meeting that they send you a little paper in the mail and tells you, you (laughs) this is the destiny of your life. Either you're getting out or you're not. And so they decide that with just a couple of words on a piece of paper that's, you know, informally sent to you. It's like waiting on test results, but a whole lot worse. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly like that. Wow, that had to be devastating. 2016, I mean, you're you're yeah. walking the walk. You're you're in this program. You're teaching people, helping yeah. helping people learn their computer skills. So when they get out, right. they become better people. So yes. you're helping to re- rehabilitate other uh, and inmates uh, under other right. individuals that are mm-hmm. locked up with you. And definitely, and, and it's oh my goodness, I, you know, I'm feeling feeling it right now. Yeah, the, the the horror, the the frustration that you had mm-hmm. to have felt. So, oh, all right, 2016, you got this nice girl on the outside. You've known her since 2004. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She, all right, criminal justice. That's a good thing to have in your in your corner, <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, yeah. uh, you, you know, is she trying to help you out with your with your case, yeah. or are you she, able to, she tried. to to appeal, maybe, or? What? Yeah, we we appealed every time, and usually every time you appeal, it's just an automatic, you know, no. Uh, if you don't have any new information to give us, then we've already made our decision, and that's final. Um, so, uh, of course, it's 2016, they denied me. Um, in the meantime, I went through this entrepreneurship program, and it really had me interested in, you know, what I was going to be doing, because I already dreamed up of, like, how I was going to, you know, how I was going to live on the outside, but also a big part of that was like, well, what am I going to do to give back? Because once this, you know, this program's over, once I'm out in the world, how am I going to con- continue that contributing to people, you know, because I don't want it to stop. It's a big part of who I am. And, uh, I don't want just want to open a business and just to make money. You know, I want to do something that actually invests in people and changes lives, changes relationships. And so, uh, I had started, you know, 
doing the preliminary work on that. And this is while you're still on the inside. Right. Yeah. On the inside, writing out my business plan. I got in contact with some people, uh, in Little Rock that do free consulting for businesses that are thinking about, you know, opening a business. They look over your, your plan and they give you their ideas and how you should revise this. And so I was going back and forth with them on that. I went to an entrepreneurship, uh, program and was, you know, really learning. It really turned, you know, a lot of the thoughts I had on, on, on my, on its head. So just learning about uh, having an entrepreneurial mindset, and which is pretty much what I was trying to do, which is you know not just being in it for making money, but to be in it for you know giving back. What's something? What's a what's a need that you can serve that you can fulfill that's not being met yet? Sure, the whole reason I got into radio promote other people. The whole reason I go. started this podcast is to Absolutely. learn about other people. Great example. You're right. Y- you know, and uh, so all right. So when's the next time you get to go for parole or, or when are you heading out? When are you getting out of yeah. this box? <laughs> and so it was like every year since then it was, so it was like 20, 2015 denied, 2016 denied, 2017 denied. And then I got, uh, I was actually put off because the parole commissioner that came in was, uh, somebody who at the time had been a sheriff in Faulkner County. And so he had stood trial against me, <laughs> and now he was going to be my person determining whether I was going to get parole or not. And so that's extreme bias there. And so they had to put it off. And of course, he's still on the board, so it limits my, you know, possibilities of actually making parole. If you're on the board, even though he's not supposed to have to vote, they still talk to each other. So. And this is in 2018 or 17. That was in 17, and then. Uh, what was it? 2018. So it was denied, 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 denied. And then 2018, I was denied. We're getting closer to now. So what month in 2018? I'm <laughs> so in 2018, I see. I went for, for parole in July, I believe it was, and they denied me one more time and didn't even really want to hear anything that I had to say or ask me any questions. They just they ran in. It was very uh, like prompt, but it wasn't like nothing was ready. And so they ran us in this little bitty room, which is, uh, you know, sort of unorthodox for those types of meetings. And she was just sort of scrambled, you know, just shifting her papers everywhere, trying to find my file. And she's like, okay, has anything changed since last year? And I was like, no, I'm still doing the same thing I was. She said, okay. I'm like, that was it. Lift. And, of course, I got the denial paper. So I wrote another, another uh, reconsideration. Breaker. Yeah, right. And so, to, at this point, you know, Tara thinks I'm just never getting out. And uh, yeah, you so got this nice place. girl outside, and that's giving yeah. you hope, something to yeah. live for. You know, yeah, it's amazing what a what a girl will do in that respect. Where you, all right, I, I'm, I got some, I got a goal, I got something to work for here. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, she was incredibly strong through all this, and she's running for city council for Conway uh, at this time. And, hey, all uh, right. Yeah, yeah. So she did, you know, great through her campaign and like staying strong through this. And anyway, so radical reconsideration, and they were like, "Okay, we want to meet with you." And so I was like, <laughs> "That just blew my mind because that just doesn't happen." Um, so I went in for the reconsideration. They were like, "You know, these things just don't happen, right?" And I was like, "I'm very aware. I've been paying attention." And uh, and what month was this in July? In uh, that, was, that was the next month. So it was August. Mm-hmm. And so I went up and ended up making parole, you know, just out of nowhere. Hey, uh, mazel tov. Had, had, yeah, right. I had every expectation of having to do another year in prison and then just not knowing if I was ever getting out, you know, almost giving up hope myself. And uh, so I got out in October. And of course, the first thing we did was go eat tacos from this taco truck that Tara loves in Conway. Yes, please. And, uh, tacos. <laughs> Sounds like a great yeah. celebration to me right there. Yeah. And uh, moved in with, you know, my, I had to parole out to my parents' house because you have to have some supervision at first when you move out. And um, and this is in left, Jerusalem man. still? No, uh, they live in Moralton. Oh, okay. uh, this isn't my... Yeah, that's not my birth father either. She she ended up divorcing him, uh, and a few years later, she found my stepdad, who I find to be more of a father than anybody else I've had in my life, you know. And uh, so they're they're very happy. They treat each other very well, 
And so anyways, I moved in with them and, uh, worked, you know, extremely hard from the get out. You know I mean? My wheels have been spinning for years thinking about what I'm going to do and building these plans and, uh, you know, getting, getting absolutely everything prepped as I possibly can before I get out so that the, when the, if the tires hit the pavement, I can just go. And so get out. I file for my business. Um, I realize, you know, that there is a need that I can feel that actually uses all of my talents, whether it be, you know, my art design, uh, my, my painting or uh, the social skills that I've learned you know, my computer skills. And so I combine you know, music and just everything and uh, put it into a business that I call Thai King Services. Thai King Services. Mm-hmm. And that's marketing in Moralton, Arkansas then. It is, but I hate calling it marketing and I hate calling it like digital advertising. I hate calling it graphic design because it's like, it just boxes you in and it doesn't make any sense because I'm not just doing, here's what I like to do with the business is like i said not just making money it's about investing in people's lives but something that i've seen in you know uh, lots of businesses and even people and how they see businesses is like they sort of objectify each other and like for a business it's like we want customers and for the people out there they're like okay well i need this business you know what i mean and so they don't really see each other for people and you're sort of objectified as something you need or something you stay away from and uh, so I was like, sure. And you opened this up uh, immediately in October then? Mm-hmm, in October. And then started right off the gate. Fantastic. Uh, yep. Right off the gate. So opened that up, uh, started building. Of course, I'm good with graphic design. So I built my own logo and website and everything and got the Facebook page up. Try to relearn how to use the internet after you know twelve years. Um, they don't let you do, so much. use the internet while you're inside. I'm guessing then. Oh no, absolutely not. You're cut off from everything. No, no devices. No, I mean you've got like a an AM FM radio you can get. <laughs> well, you know that's definitely not like in the movies. Then uh, no, <laughs> you see some of these people that are uh, that seems like they're living a normal life. They're just stuck yeah, in a box. Right? <laughs> just make a call here and there. No, it's not like that at all. Okay. So, so you weren't kingpin. Works. Yeah. <laughs> Touch screens. That was something that blew my mind for a little while when I got up. I mean, this is just how recently that was, you know. But I've always been very quick to acclimate myself and, you know, learn new software and how to use it. So, Sure. I, uh, so it seems like yeah. you kept up your skills, at least software-wise. Whether- I did. Yeah, definitely. As far as, like, when I was in the computer lab, you know what I mean? Uh we had you know all the way up to like windows 10 i think that was um but also i would you know read lots of magazines or books or anything that came through uh on technology because you know i just love technology anyway but reading on how these things work and so but it's kind of like you know you re- read a manual on how to build a, a motorcycle but it's very different when you actually get in there and actually try to do it with your hands you know so absolutely so you were building websites using photoshop uh Making mm-hmm. pictures, uh, doing yeah, things like that. Yep. Uh, yep. What other so skills did you acquire inside that are helping you out in this job? Oh, man, I would say not the biggest one because I mean I've always been really good at you know working with computers and uh, building software and building apps and things like that. But like social skills, that's the biggest one, and I think that's the most important because talking to people and how you deal with them and how you treat people i mean it just it matters because not only are you affecting the job or you know the the contract or whatever but you're affecting these people's lives and then everybody else that's connected to them it's sort of a ripple effect you know what i mean and so whatever kind of impact you're making on this one person it's actually gonna go out and affect all these other people and then you know inevitably it affects all those people that they're connected to so keeping that mindset in mind i uh Started the business and uh, started advertising as just like, I was like, well, what do I call this then? Because what I want to do is connect businesses to people and people to businesses, but have them see that these businesses are run by human beings. You know what I mean? And I want to, I want the human beings to know each other. Sure. You know? And so I was like, oh, digital advertising or marketing. And I was like, hey, there's like millions of people out there that are doing the same thing, whether it's a big business or as a uh, freelancers or what. And so 
Um, I was like, okay, and that's what made me want to just call it Tyking Services anyways, because I'm attaching my own name to it, uh, showing that this is a person that's doing this. Uh, I'm using my skills and my talents to create something for you. Well, if there's one thing that your, your parents gave you is a great name, Ty King. That's yeah, fantastic. Right? That is a pretty good name, right? And that's a good name for a company, and it okay. is. Absolutely. And I just added services on there because there's like so much that I do, and it's like it's hard to box it in, and I don't, I don't like doing that. But uh, And it kind of leaves it open for the future because I continue to learn new skills. And as I get new clients, um, like each one of <laughs> they'll ask me to do something I've never done before. And I'm like, yeah, we can do that. Let's do it. And because I know I can end up, I can figure it out. I can adapt. I can learn. And you know what? I'm going to try to do it much better than who I just learned it from. So how do they find you, Ty King Services? It is, well, I've got a website called tykingservices.com. That's T-I-K-I-N-G services.com. I I see it says wordpress.com on there. Yeah, uh, I'm going through some changes right now. Uh, but if you put TikingServices.com in, it goes straight to the website. It will. Okay. It'll forward straight to it. I'm I about to have a... Yeah, I want to be I'm able to find big, you. Going through a big update right now. And so it's it's about to look a lot different. Oh, cool. Here in a couple, in a couple of days. Um, and, of course, we're on Facebook. And you know, my phone number's out there. You know, 501-208-6801. Sure uh, email. I mean, just any way you can possibly contact somebody that's out there. Just go to the Facebook page. Um and so that's what I've been doing is working with clients, getting them connected with a the website, their social media management, and showing them how to make posts that actually appeal to people and gets them invested. And, you know, it makes a positive impact on their lives. You know what I mean? Because that's who they're going to remember. I mean, you remember the ones that made a negative impact, of course. You know? Oh, sure enough. But you don't want a negative, <laughs> you don't want those negative relationships like that. That's and correct. so, yeah, I've been working with businesses and, and training them on how to do that and doing a lot of management for them. Uh, I got into this new thing oh, uh, yeah. that not a lot of people are doing. It's uh, Facebook Messenger bots. Please. Mm-hmm. And so. How does that work? Basically, like if you had a, <laughs> a personal assistant who know who knew the answer to every question that a customer could probably have about your business. Well, with the new AI, it seems like uh, Google in particular is trying to come up with AI that mm-hmm. you will not dis- know the distinction between uh, uh, an actual yeah. human or the AI right. itself. Yeah, so, the way, yeah, the way I program these bots are that they'll even have, like, you see the little dots that jump up when somebody's typing on the other end? Sure. You'll get that. You'll get them spaced out. I mean, it, I try to make it with the personality uh, of another person. You know what I mean? Try to make it friendly and, you know. Uh, it's easy for the user, of course, but also guide you through all the information you might need, like you know how to get to the website, how to make a consultation. Uh, what, what is this company? What is it about? You know what I mean? What are the services that you offer? And so, offering any of those, um, I did some work for uh, Credit Counselors of Arkansas. Sure. And that that bot's about to come out. Um, I'm working with a church here in Moralton. And we're going to see, we're going to explore how we can use this uh, Facebook Messenger bot on their website to, you know, I don't know, just get people to, to know not only the service times, like the basics, but like, you know, to reach out. And, you know, maybe somebody's reaching out because they want help. You know what I mean? Maybe they're at a, a part in their life where they need some guidance or, you know, some uh, advice or something. And this would. Well, I know I, for one, don't want to be chained to this computer all the time. So, sure, a, a robot yeah. would would be ideal in that situation. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so it guides people to where they can find you or, you know, find, you know, any, uh, the answer to any question they might have about you. And so it's like having that personal assistant, but you don't actually have to pay them any money. So <laughs> they're always there and they're always, you know, we, we watch, um, you know, where do people fall out at? You know I mean? Where they're not connecting with and how can we change this? And so I'm constantly doing that. Well, um, wave of the future. The robots are taking our jobs. <laughs> yeah yeah but it's not at all i mean like it, it creates new jobs i mean look what i'm doing this is what, no, what i'm doing sure. for a living is programming these bots so that no. you can have more time on your business doing the important things that you usually wouldn't have to have time to, to focus on you know what i mean if you're having to focus on the, yeah if you're having to focus on the marketing and doing the 
digital advertising yourself or making posts on Facebook yourself. I mean, it takes away from the other things that your business that you need to take care of. You know what I mean? I mean, what are you, what are you doing for business anyway? What are the services you offer? What are the products that you sell? Believe me, if your attention is dragged every direction. Sure. So, I mean, I try to make it easier on people, but also help them be like, man, don't forget these clients you're going after. They're people. Yeah. And these people need to see you as a person. And so that's what I do is, uh, the connecting the two. And also, you know, my name's attached to it and it's easy to find me on Facebook. And so, uh, the way I live my life, you know, I post it on Facebook all the time, all the things I'm doing. So hopefully I can make a positive impact through that because I'm still leading worship. At, oh, you know, that's great. So your, your faith is still strong then, I guess. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm still leading worship at several different churches. Uh, just led for a youth group last night at first Baptist. Hey. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just it's so many different things going on. Uh, and so I try to post there and because I want, you know, your brand is not only your business, but it's also how you live your life. And so you're never off the clock and then you get to go be this other person. Well, that's so, the trouble with having your own business is you can work literally 24 hours a day, even yeah, dreaming yeah. about it. Uh, it. You've never worked harder than when you had your own business. That, yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> you know, when I worked for somebody else, it was punch a clock and go home. And mm-hmm. now, now you, you you have your own business, and you're definitely all the time thinking about things that you can make make your business oh, yeah. better and make other people better, for that matter. Exactly, in your business, exactly. sir. Yep. And so, I mean, also it's a reflection of your life, your lifestyle, and how you live. You know, what I mean, if you're if you're that type of person who's trying to make other people's lives better, then you know uh, the things you do, you know, not just with your business's logo attached to it, is going to reflect that. Well, you started from the bottom, and now you're here. <laughs> yeah, I'm right here. And so the, the business has really picked up. You know, t- uh, Tara and I are getting married in October. Hey, all right. Yay. <laughs> uh, I've got a great relationship with her family. Got to meet all of them, and uh, you know, uh, I love weddings. Her, da- her daughter already <laughs> considers me as you know her dad. And wow, um, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it sounds I've like you got, got it all together there, Ty King. As we're rounding I don't know this if I've out, got it all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're getting it. You're getting it all down. Yeah, I'm getting it together. Yep. Uh, have, any you know, have, you know, any bits of advice years. for the folks that are trying to start out in this business, for, perhaps, or or trying to get in business, or trying to, okay, to get in business? Yeah. That's how I really love to work with is like new businesses now, nah, because it's like with old businesses, you like you have to go to these people on the end. Like there's these executives that you have to meet with, and they've got to get everything approved through a board. Sure. And like there's there, they've got to basically forget everything that they already know. And like this one company I work with now, like they've been open for you know thirty over thirty years, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm like I'm trying to help. They'll tell me themselves that you know we we operate from 1985. <laughs> like, yeah, let's. Uh, you can't run a business in 2019 from 1985. Move uh, them into the future here. Exactly. So with new businesses, it's like it's good. You're fresh. You don't have to relearn. You're actually just learning. And so for new businesses, I would say don't forget that your clients are people and that you need to present yourself as a person and not just an entity or a corporation or, uh, you know, just, just a logo. But you actually have a face, you're a person with feelings and emotions. You're not perfect. Uh, but you've got this talented skill, whatever it is that you're trying to offer people, you know? So don't just try to talk to people, sell it, trying to, you know, have an underlying, you know, sell in mind. Talk to people for, you know, as being people. Well, sounds like you've had, you know, this is the whole reason that I started this. I, I wanted to learn about people and learn about what their situation, how, where they came from. And it sounds like right. you've had a story to tell in your 33 years. You've uh, you've come from nothing to, hey, something. You're, you're yeah. heading in the right direction. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Ty King. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Hey, no problem. Thank you. As a uh, modest mouse says, float on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, thank you so much. Uh, you feel like we got it all? I, I feel it. Yeah. Well, let's. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to put this up probably tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dan. Bye, Ty King. Right, bye. Ty King. You know, sometimes when I do these things, I don't know where the conversations are going to go. And that conversation went in an interesting 
way. I didn't know where Ty King started from. I didn't know that he had just gotten out and he is starting his life. And I mean, one thing real interesting that I found out in the story is that in America, they could throw you in jail for five days with no contact, kind of like solitary confinement. I had no idea about that. And then a speedy trial could be up to two years. So he was two years in jail in general population with no trial. I don't think I've ever heard about that before. I need to look in a, a little bit more. Learning with you. What makes you smarter? That's my other podcast. I'm going to start learning. Learning more. You could learn every day. And I, I've known his fiance for a little while, and she is a very, very nice person. So if anybody could straighten him up and, and keep him in a life worth living, uh, yeah, it's going to be her. So nice to meet Ty King. Nice to have a little conversation with him. My goodness, that is what makes you famous, Ty King. If you want to be a part of the show, give me a call, 501 470 6386. Or email me at what makes you famous at radio what dot com. Ty King, find him on the web. Let him help you with your web presence. Keys Dan, radio what dot com. DJ Little Rock dot com. Peace. I'm out of here. Radio What, the music you want. Hey guys, this is Shelly G with a fast fact. About 80% of VCRs are made by Japanese companies. Do you have a fast fact? Share it with us at Interactive Radio, RadioWhat.com. Hey, Keys Dan. What you doing? My line. I'm playing the best music by request. 24 hours a day. Click on the request tab at the top of RadioWhat.com. RadioWhat.com. RadioWhat.com.